My name is Juliana Nicolasian, and today is October 22nd, 2010. I'm visiting with Dr. Jim Bowes on the Oklahoma State University campus in Stillwater, Oklahoma. This interview is one of a series of interviews with members of the OSU class of 1960 who are on campus for their 50th reunion. And this interview is part of the O State Stories Oral History Project of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Well, let's begin by learning a little bit more about you. Where are you from originally? Where did you grow up? Bessie, Oklahoma. It's in the western part of the state, uh, down between Clinton and Cordell, Oklahoma. A city of about 205 people. Probably always be 205 because nobody's building any new houses. Wow, and, and did you grow up on a farm? Uh, we had a farm. We raised wheat, cotton, and alfalfa hay, and, uh, and we farmed in West Texas and had around 5,000 acres of, of land, and there were five boys and five girls, and, and my dad and that was, that was the team that, that did all the work, and we hired occasionally during harvest extra people, but uh, yeah, I grew up on a farm. I've got a lot of hours in a tractor seat. Mm. And did you have a favorite farm chore? Or were all chores not so much fun? But Well, you, you're always looking for the easiest one, you know, and I guess that was going after the cows in the pasture and then just had one cow to milk, so that was the easiest. And the, and the most unfavorite was just combining wheat and then heading south because the wind was, or, or heading north, the wind was always behind you, blowing the, the trash out of the combine, you know, the straw and stuff over the top of your neck and into your eyes, and so just that one direction when you were when you were cutting wheat where it was just really miserable. Mm. Eyes would be red, you know. But then when you turned and headed back uh, south and there's a fresh breeze. <laughs> well, were you always interested in going to college growing up? That's all I ever heard from my father. My father, uh, well, really my grandfather, he, uh, in Bessie, Oklahoma, he gave room and board to the, to the school teacher. He had one school teacher. And so, when my dad graduated, he spent uh, five years in the eighth grade because my dad, my grandfather wouldn't let him uh, leave school until he had a chance to go to the university and his younger brother was, was five years younger. So he waited until uh, my uncle Carl was old enough to go to college and so then they both went, they came to Oklahoma State University in a Model T car and it took him, I guess, two days to get here. Now it takes about two and a half hours. So uh, he, he really, really loved Oklahoma a and And that's all I heard all my life is, well, you know, when you get up, grow up, you're going to go to Oklahoma a and you're going to be a mechanical engineer. I never heard anything else. Nobody else advised me except my English teacher in high school, uh, Thelma Brantley. Uh, she said, uh, where are you going to go to school? And I, I told her Oklahoma a and She said, well, you'll need to learn how to write themes. And there'll be five paragraphs long, introduction, you know, conclusion, and, and three paragraphs in the middle. And so we practiced on, on writing, uh, you know, five paragraph themes for as long as I can remember hmm. in, in high school. And so I came up here and English was pretty easy. I did have three teachers though uh, in English. That, they changed the first one for some unknown reason. The second one was drafted into the military. The third one we finished with it. But in each case, we always started off with an F on our first on our first paper. It seemed like to be a tradition. Where'd you have English class? Oh, golly, I guess that was that was probably in the classroom building. I think it was up by then, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I'd been in the uh, classroom building. Hmm. Yeah. Well, we'll get back to the classroom building, but uh, what year did your father graduate and what was his major? Well, he was in mechanic arts. That's what they called it back then. And he, he graduated in 1917. And just at the end of the second, or the First World War, he got on a troop train. They were going to ship him out. He got all the way to Guthrie, Oklahoma. They declared an armistice, and so he just went home. <laughs> so that that was his tour of duty. It was one day, so he was a veteran of one day. Always a little embarrassed about it, but it was just one day. But, but he was a veteran. He a, had a uniform and everything. So. And why was he so interested in you pursuing mechanical engineering? <clears throat> well, my grandfather and, and even my father, they were, you know, they started off with horses, you know, and then they got, you know, they got the first one-horse engine, which was, uh, which was kind of small and it was kind of large for a one-horse engine. And then when the tractors, 
first came out to be sold, they were all mechanical. See, and so you had to you had to learn uh, how to how to drive the tractor. Then they were also in the uh, hardware business, so they sold tractors. And so if they sold a tractor to a farmer, then you know these farmers would get on this tractor. He used to talk all the time, and they want to stop, and they'd yell, "Whoa, whoa!" You know, they just they were still used to, to driving you know working horses. So uh, he always had that that interest in in, uh, in mechanics. And so whenever he was young and my grandfather, who was a hardware dealer in Bessie, bought a one horse engine and brought it home and my dad took it completely apart and my grandfather looked at it and he says, he didn't know what to say. So he says, I, if you can put it back together and make it run, I'll buy you a new Model T car. And he did. Wow. So he, he had a Model T car, which later on my cousin drove the thing and I don't know exactly where that car is right now. but. That's just, just familiarity with, with, with something that was new and exciting, and that was tractors and machinery and that sort of thing, and not have to put up with horses. Well, when was the first time you came to Oklahoma A&M? Well, it was, the first, it was the day before school started. Uh, my, uh, my dad brought me up, and I had a twin brother named Bob, and he also graduated the same time I did, the same degrees and everything, and uh, he just dropped us off at Bennett Hall. And uh, we looked around, you know, and he had given us a, a, a checkbook, you know, so I didn't have to worry about money. And he uh, gave us a checkbook. And I remember that first, that first day we were here, we, there was no cafeteria open in Bennett Hall, so we didn't know where we were going to eat. But we did have some money, and so one of the guys says, well, you, we can go downtown here in, in Stillwater. On the, you know, on the uh, north side of town, there's a small grocery store, and they had garlic, bologna, and bread. And so we bought a loaf of bread. and chunk of garlic and felt like we were just out there in the field and that's the way they used to feed us at harvest time, you know, something simple, you know, and, and then fed you two or three times a day so that you wouldn't be sleepy all the time. So, yeah, I came here the first time the day before school started. My roommate told me, he said, now don't, they're giving placement tests over in uh, Gallagher Hall. You go in the little lap board and he, my roommate, I didn't room with my twin brother Bob because he, he it was embarrassing to always be referred to as the twins. So uh, he said, don't do too well, because if you do, they're going to put you in an advanced class and you'll have a really, really hard time. Well, I didn't do too well in English and other courses that first semester. I told my dad at Thanksgiving, this is a piece of cake up here. <laughs> Second semester, they took the slack out of the road, but we were just a repeat of high school the first semester because I did so poorly on the placement. Mm. <laughs> told me to do, you know, don't don't get in over your head, Jim. You know, so okay, whatever. Well, what was it like living in Bennett Hall? Well, probably not a lot different. Um, we did have some football players over there with us, and they always they always provided a tremendous amount of entertainment. Uh, they would get some hot dogs and then get a waste basket full of paper, and then they'd cook the they cook hot dogs in the uh, in the hallway, you know. And then one time, I guess they got bored and they. And they poured some lighter fluid underneath our door and set it on fire. And, you know, they, they did things that right now, if, if you did that, well, you'd be sent to counseling. Nobody right. could understand why you would do something like that. But back then it was just all in fun, you know. So uh, it was, you know, it was pretty nice. We had a really, really good cafeteria. You know, if you come off a farm, you know, you'd go up and have your choice of two or three things to, to eat during uh, meal time. Well, that was, that was a plus. I was at home and there were there was never more than seven children at home at one time. You got your designated piece of chicken, you know, you got mashed potatoes and gravy, whatever, but up here you had your choice of maybe three different entrees, you know, so I don't know, we didn't call them entrees, but but you, you had a choice and that's what that was different, you know, than we always ate well at home. Mm -hmm. and we ate we ate well here at the university. Tuition was about seventy dollars a month. Mm -hmm. No, seventy dollars a semester. Mm -hmm. All the courses you wanted to take. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could take five hours, ten hours, whatever, all one price. And how many courses did you start out taking? Well, probably the normal load, 16 hours, somewhere around there. I can't remember. Did you have an on-campus job? Oh, no. No, no. I had, an, I had a full-time summer job working on the farm. And before that, my dad just, he just sent us to school. So I was really lucky. I had that, what we call Ed Bow scholarship, you know, just... <laughs> He did ask us one time, my brother and I, why we weren't spending so enough money. He said, it doesn't seem like you guys are spending hardly any money. Well, 
we didn't have to have any money back when we were growing up because we lived in Bessie, which, you know, you didn't need a whole lot of money. There wasn't a movie store, there wasn't anything. It's just, you know, just pretty, pretty sparse living, you know. I remember I started out one summer with about 30 cents in my pocket. At the end of the summer, I still had 30 cents. Well, while you were here in Stillwater, you had a lot of time on your hands outside of studying. What did you do for fun? We in engineering. I remember <laughs> we didn't have a whole lot of time on our hands. I guess I was... Surely you did something. You didn't study oh, all yeah. the time. Oh, no. No, not all the time. I remember we used to take a, about a half hour off after, after the dinner, the evening meal. And I had a good uh, friend from out of uh, Sarah, Oklahoma. He was a taskmaster. You know, 30 minutes, then back to school. You know, back upstairs and, and study, and uh, we'd study till about 10 o'clock. And other people would, just, you know, study all night long, never, never did study. We just studied whenever it was daylight. But uh, it, was, it was different. There was no air conditioning in the building. But, you know, it's, there was no air conditioning at home either. Mm -hmm. So, we used to. Uh, campus hangouts? Well, it used to be right down here on the end of Washington Street. There was the, the white white barn or something over there. Cliffs Cliffs Cafe. That's right, it's Cliffs Cafe. One of the guys in, on the floor had a car, and every once in a while he'd take some of us down and go down here to Cliffs and sit there and eat hamburgers or whatever they were serving. And, but uh, without a car, you didn't do just a whole lot. Mm -hmm. But uh, but he did have a car, and he was. You know, that was unusual for a person to have a car, and then one of the guys on the floor had a girlfriend. That was unusual, too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so. And, and would you date much? Uh, not, not, not very much, because I don't think I ever had a, a single date in high school, mm -hmm. uh, because I was from Bessie, and, you know, I mean, that was 10 miles, we rode a bus, and so, you know, and the girls at Bessie, they, they were... We'd known them all their lives, so and there's only two of them in my class, my eighth grade class. And, and they were not really nice girls, but they uh, they had boyfriends out of Clinton, you know. So uh, we lost all that. But uh, it was I mean, I'm not a I wouldn't be considered a social animal. I mean, I'm I'm okay now, but you know, back then, I mean, it was you know, I had uh, four sisters. See, so I mean, it wasn't like I. It was something novel about them. I mean, you know, they were, they were girls. Girls were girls, you know. But uh, I, you know, I, I enjoyed looking at them. There was all different kinds. More girls in one spot than I'd ever seen in my whole life. Hmm. Would they congregate in certain parts of campus, or? Yeah, right over here on uh, the corner of the biz, uh, business and the classroom, there was a hut, and uh, and that was where you go and drink coffee. And, and I mean. It was a white frame building right there at that corner, and I'm not sure, but I think maybe the proprietors of that were had sight problems, and I think I can't remember the name of the of the hut, but I think it was maybe called the hut. The Y hut. The Y hut. Okay. All right. How do you know all that? <laughs> so so we go in the Y hut every once in a while and have some coffee, but uh, I didn't. I hadn't drunk coffee when I was out in Bessie, Oklahoma. We just didn't. I mean, it wasn't a big thing on the. Uh, at, at the house, that's what everybody else was doing, you know. All everybody wore Levi's and a white T-shirt. That was that was it. Everybody looked alike. Hmm. Took ROTC, you know. I mean, everybody was doing the same thing. You had to take ROTC back then, in the first two years. So you had to wear your uniform on certain days of the oh, week. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. You go and always look over there at the armory or where the School of Architecture is now, and look up on the top to see which flag was was flying. You know, sometimes it, it was, there were certain times, you know, whenever you went from the summer dress to winter dress, it didn't make any difference, you know. You could be burning up in whatever you had, but it wasn't time to go to uh, the summer dress yet. And so, you know, you lived by the flag. Hmm. Of course, we had our own rifle over there that we had to clean. And an old guy here in town, I can't remember the name, I can't, don't know if he's still alive, his name was Mize. He was a sergeant in the Army. And boy, I tell you what, it didn't make any difference what you did with that rifle. It was never clean enough. And then a lot of times, it always he could always find rust. And if you had rust on it, well, then you had to you had to clean all the rust off of it and oil it up. And you know, it was just I guess I guess they thought this was going to make soldiers out of all of us. Hmm. Well, I, I heard back in in your day as a student that engineering was quite rigorous on campus. 
it was quite rigorous then, and, and it's also rigorous now. I know now, it, yeah, yeah definitely now, but back then it was quite rigorous. Yeah, yeah, there was a, in 1955, I guess until about four or five years ago, was the largest class that we had at, at, OS, at Oklahoma and in, in OSU. But now I think the enrollment's gotten bigger than that, so 55 was a big year. But uh, yeah, you, you had to study quite a bit. Any any memories stand out from some of your instructors? Oh, there's some real characters. Uh, Carol M. Leonard, he was a professor in, uh, in mechanical engineering. And uh, I remember one, one summer we were taking a class uh, from him in the in Cordell South, and it was really, really hot. And uh, it, he was sitting in a chair lecturing, and he fell asleep while he was lecturing. Of course, the class just sat there, and he, and he kept on mumbling about something, and he kept mumbling about his girlfriend or something. And of course, we knew his wife. But, uh, well, he woke up, and he says, what I say? what I say? And everybody <laughs> just sat there and just stared at him. But, yeah, old Leonard, did, you've probably heard of Leonard's Jewelry downstairs, downtown. His son is the one that had that jewelry business, and, uh, and that's probably the one thing that, you know, the story that I tell quite a bit because I know his son, who has the jewelry store, but, oh, there were so many of them, you know. Hmm. Some of them very good. I remember there was one in electrical engineering named Paul McCollum. Oh, he was, he was a dangerous person. He made things look so easy, you didn't want to study in his class, and then you'd get wiped out on a test, you know. But he was really, really good. And, uh, but, but he was one that I can remember as being one of the better teachers. He was never promoted to professor because he didn't have a doctor degree or something, mm -hmm. which I always thought was, you know, back at that time it was a little unfair, and it's probably still unfair too for people that just like to teach and not get so uptight about all the other things that you're supposed to do. So I, while you're going to school for your undergraduate degree, did you kind of have an idea of what you wanted to do, what you wanted to be? No, not a clue. My dad said he wanted me to go up to school in mechanical engineering. I said, I'd go until I flunk out. He said, sounds good enough to him. Uh, I don't think when you come in as a freshman, you have any idea what engineers do. You think you do, but you really don't. And uh, it takes a while to, to figure that out. And if you're not careful, you know, you can get discouraged in the first few years because all you're studying are basics. You know, you don't. But they're getting better than that now mm -hmm. than, than what we did back then. But I, I kind of knew what uh, mechanics was, was all about, you know, and mechanical things. Cause my dad bought my twin brother and I a Model T car. I still have it. It's 1927. And uh, we would go ahead and uh, uh, take it apart, overhaul it, put new rings in it, do all sorts of things. And my dad was really good about letting us do that, you know. And occasionally he'd have to come in and help us to straighten out what got messed up. But, but I had some idea, but I didn't have any idea about uh, what engineering was. And when did you figure it out? Oh, probably in about the last uh, 10, 15 years. You know, so they, not even while you were in school? Well, you still, you know, it's going to school isn't real. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's not like going to work. I worked at, uh, at Ford one summer and worked Caterpillar and work for the Air Force, and uh, unless you get out and go to work, you know, you really, it's, um, you, what, what you learn in school is not, is not what, what is out there on the job, because out there on the job you think, you know, you're going to go out there and you're going to set the world on fire, you're going to design a rocket, you know, you're going to do all this and all that. I remember one time I went to uh, Stanford to a summer course. And I thought, boy, this is going to be something, because Stanford is something, you know. And, and uh, walked in there, and they described the first project that we were going to work on, and it was the study of a pair of uh, vice grip pliers mm -hmm. to try to cut the manufacturing cost. I tell you what, we tried everything. We, we never could come up with something that the manufacturers said, well, that's a good idea, because, man, everybody taking all the thought um, out of it where you know you could come in and make it so generally it depends you know if you go to work for some company you probably not get to explore a lot of things that you may think of or dream of because you know you have a job to do and so forth and so on you know if you went to work for General Motors or something like that you you probably wouldn't have a whole lot of freedom unless you was one of the big boys you know one of the 
designers or conceptual designers or stuff like that, but generally there's a lot of work that's just pretty routine. But it can be enjoyable. I mean, you know, it's it's nice to do something and, and later on find out well, what you did was right. Well, after you received your undergraduate degree in which year? 1960. Okay. Mm -hmm. So after you received your degree, what did you go on to do? Well, <clears throat> right at the, about the time I finished my uh, graduate degree, um, undergraduate degree, the Russians put Sputnik in here, bachelor's or master's. Well, then everybody that had any kind of brain at all was then recruited to go to graduate school mm -hmm. because, you know, that was, the, that was in the challenge. And so <clears throat> I went right into graduate school and, uh, you know, ended up just staying here until I finished uh, a PhD, not, not, never only intention even getting past a, a bachelor's degree or even a bachelor's degree, bachelor's degree, but that's just the way it happened. I mean, just kept going to school because I didn't flunk out, like I promised my dad. My dad was a little bit concerned though when I told him I was going to try to get a, uh, a PhD, and he was he was concerned that if, if I wasn't successful with that, it might uh, it might bother me. Well, thunder, I'd already been bothered enough up here by some cranky old professors. I mean, I, I wasn't under any illusion that this was just a piece of cake. But it, it wasn't hard. You just had to keep keep after it. I mean, you just had to keep. Didn't want to get behind. That's one thing you don't want to do is get behind. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, Did your father attend uh, every graduation? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my twin brother and I both got PhDs at the same time, and you know, it just. It's a big day, you know, all, a lot of colors, a lot of gowns and caps and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, he enjoyed it. And where was graduation held? Uh, in Gallagher. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Gallagher I've been now, it's, it's Gallagher back then. Mm -hmm. He did wrestle for Ed Gallagher. Really? He did, yeah, uh-huh. Hmm. Yep, sure did. Did you uh, enjoy the wrestling? Oh, yes, I'll tell you what, I saw one wrestling match with OU where OU had Dr. Death. And I don't know if you remember that one, but but the guy, the, the OU fans are up there in, the, in Gallagher uh, just yelling, you know, Dr. Death, Dr. Death, Dr. Death. And going into the final match, uh, the heavyweight match, is that if our heavyweight didn't get pinned by Dr. Death, if he just didn't get pinned, we would tie the match. I believe that's the way it was. It was that close. Uh -huh. Well, this guy, old Dr. Death, he comes out, and our guy was, he was, he was, a, he was huge. I mean, he was heavy. I mean, he's mighty borderline on fat. But <laughs> well, Dr. Death came out and he grabbed him and, and picked him up and, he, and Dr. Death stumbled backwards and this guy fell on him and knocked the wind out of him and pinned him and just boom like that it was over with. We won the match. It just went dead silent. And then I thought the building would explode just from all the noise. Oh, it was wild and huh. crazy. It was, it was a match to behold. I mean, you, you couldn't set the stage for anything better. Those OU fans all hyped up, you know, we're going to win this match, you know, which they didn't used to win a whole lot of them. They're going to win it. They're going to beat us, you know, they were ahead. and Pretty sure that our guy was going was to pin our guy. Why? It was just about to clap your hands. It was over with. We won. But I've seen, OU, I've seen the Cowboys beat OU four times in football, so, you know, that's quite a few, and I hadn't seen them all, but, mm -hmm. but I saw some really good games. One of them, the score was 17 to 16 down there at Norman, the next year it was 15 to 14 up here. Boy, that was a long period for the people in Norman. Mm -hmm. Well, when you were a student, did you see many uh, football games, basketball games? Oh yeah, I saw Wilt uh, Chamberlain play here, you know. I saw uh, a lot of a lot of real barbers. I watched uh, Eddie Sutton play. I mean, in my freshman year, I think he was he was still playing. He was a senior. But in Moaba, you know, all of those guys. But they had some good football players. Du du Duchendorf, out from uh, Cloud Chief, Oklahoma, and in that part of the country, he played up here. Well, I saw him in high school, you know, playing basketball. And, well, he, you know, he got that ball. He'd shoot it in high school and mo make most of it. Well, in college up here, took old Hank Iba a while to you know, convince him that other people could shoot too. You know, so uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of a lot of uh, sports, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'll never, I 
could never would I'll never believe the football stadium that we have now compared to what we used to have. Man, it was just old steel bleachers, you know, with uh, with a running track around the around the inside, very Spartan. But uh, you know, it was bigger than high school, you know, football field. So yeah, seen a lot of a lot of exciting games. How was the attendance back then? Well, not as nearly as many as you have now. Because the university was smaller, and, mm. and then, but you know they they did enjoy their football. But uh, the basketball was was always well attended too, because you know you don't have nearly as many seats in Gallagher as you did out in Lewis Field back when it was Lewis Field. So, uh, how did the tickets work for students? Well, everybody kept to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wasn't like this thing over here with all these tents. Students out there trying to get that first or second row, whatever. I don't. I mean, that's that's kind of new to me to see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you you received your PhD in which year? Sixty six. Sixty six. And then what happened? Well, I went to uh, with my uh, PhD advisor had a research program going on in fluid power, so I went to uh, uh, continue to work for him. He was my advisor as an undergrad. I was a PhD student, so he hired me to work a year as a uh, just a, a employee out there. And then one long after that, well, then they were hiring new faculty members, and so then they offered me his job as an assistant professor. I don't think I'm qualified today. I don't think they'd hire me today with <laughs> with my ability. But you know, like my twin brother and I say, you know, we've pulled the wool over our eyes this long, I don't know why we can't continue to do it. So, you know, I, you know, you come from Bessie, you know, you really don't know what to expect when you come up here, whether you can handle it or not. Um, you know, and it, it, it takes a while, you know, if, uh, if you're not around mathematics, you know, your whole life, then when you get into it, it's, it's a little foreign, it's like a foreign language. And then after you use it for a number of years, then pretty soon, you know, it gets to be, well, yeah, that's what it has to be. I mean, it's just doesn't make, it wouldn't make any sense for it to be any other way. So it takes a while to, to, to convert over, I guess, from, from a farm hand, you know, to somebody that sits there and makes a living with a pencil. So you were, you were hired as an assistant professor. Mm -hmm. Did you teach? Mm -hmm. what, 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 did, what did you teach right off? Well, Jay Boggs, who was vice president up here for a while, he was the, the head of a mechanical engineering and he hired me on first job to teach uh, mechanical drawing and so uh, I taught mechanical drawing and so did my brother Bob and then after that it was kinematics and just all sorts of things you know and, and the Dean Reed who's the, the Dean right now he ended up one time having me teach nonlinear automatic control oh that was horrible because that was hard to understand let alone teach it but I got lucky there's a guy named Mulholland who was we, we team taught the course, and, and he didn't like the, the computer uh, simulation of it that I did, and I didn't like what he did, so it was a perfect match. I'd listen to him, and I learned a lot, and he would listen to me, and I, I guess he, I'm not sure he was ever interested enough to really figure out uh, numerical simulations like uh, we had to do it back then, because everything, uh, the first computer we ever had, you know, you could, not, you could not imagine how much effort it was to program it. Big long boxes of cards, you know, and you punch those with a card punch machine, you know, and you take them over and you shove them in a the window. And if there was just one mistake, you come back, you get a water paper and and no output results, whatever. And you get maybe get one turnaround every 24 hours. Hmm. Nowadays, what we did, you know, it took us 24 hours to do. You do and the amount of time it takes you just to enter it into the into the computer, so I mean, it's 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 not like anything ever before. Well, where was the first computer? Well, it's hard to say, but the biggest and the first one was probably the IBM 650 in the basement of the Home Economics Building. Hmm. It occupied oh, a room maybe three times as big as this, and it didn't have as much computer power as my wristwatch. Hmm. But uh, they started all huge and very very little capacity and they're all tube type machines and so what they had was a big huge air conditioner down there to cool these things off and you know and if one of the, the drills would be is that if the air conditioning went off well then every 
everybody that's done is supposed to come in and take the side panels off of these things so that they wouldn't, you know, overheat. And so, you know, it was it was just like a big energy consumers, you know. Wow. <laughs> and we think about today and Yeah. And I and I remember, you know, it's 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 really hard uh, it's sometimes the university to change. And I remember I I had gone to Ford and worked in the summertime on a on a computer, it's kind of a teletype that entered in stuff to the computer, and uh, I, I learned how to do, learned how to do that. You know, in the Ford, you know, and there has a very large uh, computing facilities. And I came back here, and was able to hustle up some money from I don't know exactly who, but uh, I had the opportunity to hook up to a system in uh, Oklahoma City over the telephone line. And the people in the computing department, computer department, wouldn't let us because they didn't want to let it get off off campus. And I remember we had a, a guy named Roger Kepi who was over in, in one of the other sciences, uh, came into this meeting. He said, "Honestly, I cannot understand this place." He said, "Here's a guy that has the money, has the knowledge to do this thing, and we're saying no." I thought this was a university, and boy, I mean, he he pulled it off for me. And mm -hmm. so I, I was over there with my department head to use it. To use a, a computer, you know that was that was time shared with somebody else. I mean, you just cannot imagine, you know, the reluctance of some people around this back then, maybe now too, to, to for change. I mean, it just frightened them to death. Hmm. What if we lose control? Well, who wants control? Even you're responsible. And and you know, I'm sure engineering has seen lots of changes through the years and you, you have to keep up and you have to keep innovating and oh my I mean you think you know it started off change came along you know fairly often and then nowadays I mean it's you know the, the software people are driving the computer people the computer people are driving driving the software people and it's just a mad race mm -hmm. I mean, who could ever imagine the storage devices you have on a, a simple thumb drive it, it's crazy it really is I mean it's it really is crazy well, did you remain in the classroom this whole time throughout your career? I always had a research okay. contract. Yeah. So how did you get involved with the ground source heat pump? Well, that, that's really that was an easy easy start. I was trying to figure out how to make solar systems economic, uh, and uh, see, I can't remember where I but I got some money from. Oh, it's during the Carter administration. I wrote a proposal solar assisted ground couple heat pumps because I've been messing with solar but man the economics of that were bad still are but they were they were just as bad back then because of, of uh, the first cost of them and then the storage and all this and all that so I, you somebody at the university got a call from somebody in Oklahoma City that had a problem with his his heating and cooling system that the swimming pool was being overheated by this uh, air conditioner well it turned out to be a heat pump <clears throat> And the swimming pool was so hot, the kids couldn't swim in it. He called me down and says, I need some help to get this thing uh, straightened out. He says, I can't afford any city water. I didn't know, I was trying to figure out what a heat pump was. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll go back to university and see what I can find. And I opened up one of my old textbooks, and in the back of the textbook was a section on earth coils. Earth coils, couldn't, I never heard of that before. Opened it up. and. Man, everything that I needed was right there. I thought, you know, and so I got I got interested in that. For some odd reason, I couldn't get it out of my mind. And of course, then I hopped over to the library because in the back of the book were references, in the back of those other books in the library more references, and they kept talking about the efficiency of this thing. And I, and it's hard for me to believe that it was that efficient. And nobody was doing it. So uh, I talked to uh, one of my. Uh, Professor buddies up there in mechanical engineering and said, "Hey, this looks pretty good." And he said, "Yeah, yeah it does." And we visited a little bit about it, but he didn't do anything. So I went out and saw a local uh, HVAC contractor and asked him a few questions about it and so forth and so on. About three nights later, we took an existing air source heat pump, which is uses air for energy source, which isn't you know a lot of days it's too cold that air doesn't do do you that much good. And we converted it into a water-based thing, and up about three days later, we had a water source heat pump, and hooked these coils to it, and it worked. The first one worked, and so this guy that that uh, 
his name was Jim Parton, he was next to me at the school. He, we installed one in his home. I mean, we installed it, I mean, literally, we did it. Uh, that was 30-some years ago, and it's still running. Wow. The first one we ever did worked. <laughs> but but, but they're, all, they're all together different now. The heat pumps are about 50% more efficient. Uh, the, uh, the piping that we put in the ground, is, it was always good because it was developed by the natural gas industry. And so it's really, really simple. <laughs> really simple. And again, it saves people around 30 to 35 percent of their energy and about 50 percent of their operating costs. So it, it's a it's a standard. Everything else has to compare to it. So do you field lots of calls, lots of questions? Or? Well, we formed an association because we had a lot of people involved in this thing. Right now, that association is here at Oklahoma State University, and we have about 7,000 members. Wow. So we have an annual conference up in Denver next week, and there will be around 600 people there. And we'll have Department of Energy there, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, people from all over the country, China, Japan, Korea. We even had six people here from Mongolia studying it. So uh, we, uh, we captured the, uh, the technology, and, you know, the government looks at us as the as a place where you want to go if you want to see what's going on. And uh, we've had about, uh, to this point, over $10 million worth of outside support for just the research. And I don't know how much we've had for that association, but we, you know, that really keeps me in a nice life. I have full summer employment and employment during the semester, so it gives you the kind of freedom you never thought you'd have. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of the benefits? Efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, it's about 30 to 35 percent more efficient than anything you can put out there. Uh, the operating costs are about 50 percent. There's nothing that's outdoors. Everything is either buried underground or sits in, inside like a refrigerator, and that makes the maintenance cost almost zero. Mm -hmm. I've had one in my home for 10 years, and the only thing I've ever changed is the filters. Mm -hmm. I can do that. I mean, it just, it just keeps running. I mean, just as steady as it can be. You turn it on, you expect it to come on, and uh, it's really simple. And, it, and it, it's not like some of the other renewable energy things where you have to have tremendous investment to get into the business. Here, you don't have to. You know, you can hire somebody to trench, you know, put the pipe in the ground, and then everything else indoors is the same as a conventional system. So, I mean, you can be in a really high efficient C uh, HVAC system with a minimal. Uh, outlay yourself. I mean, of course, after a while you see how much the driller's making, so then you get the idea that I'll to hold my own drilling rig. So that's generally what happens. They'll get a drilling rig and trencher, you know, and the uh, heat fusion equipment that fuses the pipe together. The pipe is, is has no um, uh, mechanical connections in it that goes underground. So it's, it'll just last forever. We tell people it has a warranted life of 50 years and expected life of 200. Wow. But in 200 years, I won't have to back it up with, <laughs> with any kind of warranty. <laughs> why, why do you think it's important to seek out uh, renewable energy sources? Well, about oh, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, it might have been longer than that, uh, Governor Henry Bellman uh, got interested in this technology through a friend of a friend. and. Uh, I went down to the state capitol and trying to sell him on the idea that those abandoned oil wells out there would be a good way to suck all the oil out of the ground, we ought to take all the heat out of the ground. So I really sold him and, you know, really talked to him and he said, well, if it's that good, we ought to do the whole state capitol. Whoa, I didn't know what to do. I thought, oh my word, I'm in over, I'm in over my head now. But uh, we did it and uh, he went and got some money from the Department of uh, Energy on oil overcharge monies and he installed it in the in the basement in the first two floors because the third and the fourth floor, I believe, were the House and the Senate. Mm -hmm. And they had their own budgets. And he said, well, you guys, you take care of your own stuff. I'll take care of the basement in the first and second floor. And that's what he did. And, of course, they, they came up with the money to, uh, to finish it out all the way out. So he was the one that, that was saying, he was a big fan of Lester Brown. You know Lester Brown? I do not. Lester Brown is a real conservationist and he wrote a written several books, Plan B and Plan 2.B, 2.0 or something, 
very, you know, very much of a conservationist, and he talks about, you know, the third world is going to demand their share of the energy, and that's what uh, Governor, Governor Bellin was talking about. And, uh, you know, back then, you know, oh, well, you know, when can that happen? When could that be? I didn't think that happened in my lifetime. Well, now we're seeing that China and those other places, that I mean, they want some of that, that energy, too, and they're going to make us, uh, make us a, a run for it, you know. I mean, here we've got this huge military defending our our oil that's overseas. <laughs> right. And so, you know, he, he could see that. And uh, and I find, and so I thought one day, you know, I had been reading this book and I thought, well, I'll just ask the, the governor uh, if you've ever read this book. And I asked him and he said, yes, he says, I've met him twice. I thought, oh boy. <laughs> so you think you're cutting a wide swath with Governor Bellman was really, really an interesting person. Boy, so consistent. So honest and so good. The day before he died, he called up and asked about a ground source heat pump for his house. Could not believe that he died the next day. I was out in the front yard mowing it, and my wife came out and says, it's Governor Bellman on the phone. I thought, what in the world, you know? But I know we'd, we'd gone several places. We went over to Oilton one time, you know, to, to a, a school. The school over there, they'd installed their own geothermal heat pump. And, and uh, he was... I mean, oil in Oklahoma, and I mean, there could be a lot of places. He'd been all over the world. He saw Sadat. He knew all those people, you know. Mm -hmm. And here we are in oil in Oklahoma talking about about heat pumps. I mean, he'd tell some really, really funny stories. And one I liked the best was when uh, Bud Wilkinson, OU football coach, was running for uh, for some office. I can't remember whether it was governor or whether it was senator. Senator. But they had been invited out to uh, some uh, Indian celebration, and you know they were campaigning. And the Indians out there had, you know, delicacy for me. That was this liver, kind of cooked in a <laughs> in a gravy, and they didn't have any utensils. And so, <laughs> Governor Belvin, he's picked his up with his hands and eating it. And he said, "Oh, Bud Wilkes had picked that up. He had that real fancy clothes on. You know, he was quite a socialite." And he said that gravy was running down his hands <laughs> on that shirt. He says, "I really think it took the fire out of him as far as the political scene." <laughs> I can see that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it just it just things like that. I've met I've met so many, so many interesting people in this business, you know, China. Uh, you know, those guys. The only thing you remember them is they're always trying to get you drunk, because they say you know unless you're drunk you never know what a, a person's true feelings. Well, I'm, I can drink a couple of them like they did, but one thing, one English phrase they all knew and that was bottoms up. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sure they said it many, many times. Oh yeah, they 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 really they're really nice nice people. But does the state capitol still run the heat pump? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. How many um, how many heat pumps do you think are are installed in Oklahoma? Well, I don't know. There's about oh about a million and a half here in the United States, and I would have no way of estimating how many in Oklahoma. Bunches of them, though. I can remember the first time I didn't know one was going in. I felt kind of shorted that they should have had me out there watching. Now, I mean, somebody's putting one in. I said, well, that's good. You know, that's about it. Hmm. And it's, it's really become, you know, kind of mainstream around here. Wow. Well, this is your 50th class reunion. Yep. Looking back, any fond memories? Well, I don't know. I'm sure I have some. I can make up some. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you know, there's, there's there's things I remember you never forget. And one time, was, I guess old Dillard was our football uh, player, you know, and or, or one of them was, and, and we had OU going. And I mean, right toward the end of the game, we just needed I don't know how many more points to to beat him. And boy, all of a sudden, old this guy he gets out there in front of behind all the OU people. I mean, he's so wide open, it's unbelievable. You would have thought that he'd run off the bench. Threw him a ball and he reached up and grabbed that ball and brought it down and he kicked it out of his hands and he phoned. I mean, you talk about a groan. But, you know, there's some things you just you just cannot imagine how, how difficult that was to accept that. We had him beat. You know, we just had him beat. But, boy, though, you know, I learned out over these years, you've got to beat him for 60 minutes. You can't mm -hmm. just beat him for... 59. Those ways 
guys have a way of scooting underneath the door. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's it's so unpredictable sometimes. Oh yeah, yeah. They they have a lot of tradition down there. But I guess they'll probably have to bring the first team up here this year. You know, I remember one year that they they had one of their tackles and put him in the backfield, and I guess he thought he was gonna you know be the best running back. I don't think he was. He gained the yard. I mean, <laughs> it looks so easy for those guys. The back the backs to carry the ball, but this tackle tried it and he didn't do anything. He just couldn't couldn't get up head of steam, I guess, whatever. Well, you know, you, you've been here for your entire educational career. You've mm -hmm. been here for your professional career. What is, what is so special about Oklahoma State University? Well, I just haven't found a better job, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been offered a lot of jobs. You could have gone anywhere, probably. Why, why stay in Oklahoma? Why, why OSU? Well, it's close to home. You know, I mean, I'm, I've got uh, sisters and brothers not too far away, and uh, I've always been treated well. You know, I always knew how much I was worth if I was working out in the industry, because I had a brother who worked for Lockheed Martin, and every time one of the professors out there said, "Boy, if I was out in the industry, I'd be doing this. I'd be making this kind of money." I'd call my old Bob up and say, Bob, how are you, what are you making? And he'd tell me, and I'd say, ah, okay, you got me a little bit, but not much. I knew all my life about what I was worth if I was working for an aircraft company. They generally pay fairly well. So the, so the, the, the pay was fair, probably more than I deserved, but i uh, take it anyhow. But uh, there's just something about it. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're always underestimated. Mm -hmm. We went up to... Uh, Brookhaven National Lab and, and uh, walked in. We had done this videotape on the ground source heat pumps there, and I'll never forget this guy named Phil Metz. He said, uh, where did you get that tape done? And I said, oh, next door on the campus, I mean, why? And he said, it's pretty good. And I thought, well, what do you mean? I mean, you know, our flush toilets are still flushing. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know it's a uh, you know, it's it, it is a an, an energy rich state. You know, and it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's got a lot going for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, what's next on the agenda for you? Well, I don't know. Hmm. I guess dying. I guess. Are you gonna keep on working, or? <laughs> well, it's it's about it's time for me to give somebody else this job because you know it's it's a good job and somebody needs a good job and so. Uh, you know, if I got a, a real problem because a, a lot of the, I've hired almost everybody in the, the, the division that I'm in. Okay, so I mean everybody else I've hired and I've seen people retire on me. I've seen some of their kids come back to school. You know, if you've been in the job for 50 years, you know, you've got a couple of cycles going mm -hmm. in there. Uh, I start talking about that and they just, you know, they, they are sincere and they say, please don't. And I guess they'd rather trust the devil they know than the devil they don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't seem to be too bossy. I don't think I am. Some of them get by with murder, but eventually they get caught up. You know, I think they get a little disappointed in how how they're doing, but thinking that you know they could talk you in, you know, a good story. You know, and it takes it, it's you know it's pretty easy to to see through a lot of stories. You know, I know when you, the uh, university. Provo talked about, we looked at, you know, a sustained performance, you know. we got some guys that run pretty hard for a while, and then they'll just start dogging it on you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you, you can tell that, you know, when you're working with uh, young faculty members, you know, you can tell those that are going to just, they're going to they're do well in spite of you, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, some of them say, well, we we'll never have any money, we can't do this, we can't do that. And others of them just, just keep on going, keep on getting things. You know, uh, oops, didn't mean to have that happen. That's just the new technology. That's it. But, you know, it's it's just really being treated well by just about everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Well, we're, we're happy you, you've made your career here at Oklahoma yeah. State and, and glad you're... Well, I've gotten out of town. I've been to <laughs> China a couple of times. I've been to Sweden, Germany, Austria. Oh, I'm sure you've been. I mean, you know, it's... All over. Uh, and you know, a nice thing about going to China and places like that, they always revere the older people. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> do they are they always shocked or you know Oklahoma State? Do they take a double take or? No, not really. They mm-hmm. uh, uh, generally the people that are here. I've got to turn this thing on. Somebody wants me that bad. I don't want to talk to them. Uh, uh, you know, when you get there, they've already heard about you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, and uh, I've always feel like that uh, I'm overrated. And then when I get talking to them for a while, you know, you got a lot going for you over here in this country, you know, and I mean, that's a lot of times we just go with reckless abandon. Mm-hmm. We get a lot of things done fast and quick. Uh, sometimes we make mistakes, but it doesn't seem to cripple anybody. You know, when we do something that wasn't, it turns out to be not as good as it could have been, or it's a bad idea to begin with. Uh, over there, well, uh, they have so many people, but they've got so many bright people too. Mm-hmm. Man, oh man, oh man. And they're so interested in what's been going on oh, yeah. and what's yeah. out there, and they're so well educated. At well, you know, uh, about a month ago or so, we had six. Uh, people from Mongolia. And, you know, I mean, and one of them spoke some English, <clears throat> you know, and, and we had him here for about three or four days, and I mean, it's it's like slow motion. But let me tell you about that third day. Uh, you could see the lights were coming on, and then all of a sudden they started thanking you for being so open with everything you had. And so you think, well, I mean, what do you mean? I wonder why they think we're so open. So he used to ask him, he said, well, the Russians occupied us for a long time. They were there to take. You guys here seem to just give us everything, just tell us everything, you know. Everything you know, open up your books, open up your homes, everything. Oh, well, uh, okay, good. Good to know that. <laughs> I don't know if I want to go to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure there's not nice. Well, my mother was born in Russia, in fact. <laughs> but she was of German parents. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, my wife thinks I'm a Russian. So you still have that old Model T? Yes. Where do you keep it? Bessie. Got a brother down there that has a nice big shop and it's just in the corner. The thing about donate like, my dad bought it from a twin brother and I think we'll donate it to the Oklahoma Museum down in Oklahoma City if they want it. It's a bright green with a, with a black fenders and everybody said, well no, all Model T's were black and not so. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you could always tell what color a car was in Model T's because whenever they manufactured them, they dipped them in paint. They had a big vat full of, of water mm-hmm. and had about this much paint on the top of it. And they just lowered the car through the paint. And that means that you could pop up the seat, take a little wax and wax it off, the, the metal underneath it, and there would be the original color. Hmm. It's bright green. And the farm is still in the family? Oh, yeah. yeah. Good. Oh, we, Hey, the family farm, they hit all the gas out there. And I mean, it's, it's embarrassing. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be crass or gross or anything like that and say, boy, you can't believe how well that's doing. But uh, Western that, Oklahoma. It's changed the lives of a lot of farmers. Oh, my. You know? They don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. You know, the Judy brothers, two boys out there west of Bessie, they changed. They all had brand new overalls on. They all had a, a checkbook in this pocket up here on the overalls and a wood pencil. Still rode in the same old truck. Three in the front and one sitting in the back, pickup. Mm-hmm. They just, but their sister now, she knew how to spend the money, but the boys didn't. It just, it came on them too late in life. Mm-hmm. My wife didn't have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's not here to defend herself. <laughs> well, we're not, we're not going to ask her to either. <laughs> well, we've kind of fast forward through through your life pretty quick, but is there anything else you'd like to mention before we end today? No, that's, that's, no, I, like I said, you know, I come a long line of people that really believe in education, you know, so uh, anybody in the family that wanted to go to school, they could go to school, you know. And did your, your kids come to Oklahoma State? Mm-hmm. Well, one of them. One of them. Yeah, Jason, Aaron, she went down northeastern uh, Tahlequah or someplace mm-hmm. and got her degree down there in criminal justice. Now, now she's she's not in that field. She's in education. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I uh, went to a wedding down in Oklahoma City, and it was one of my nephew's weddings, his, his son's wedding. And uh, I mean, I got this uh, 
program, you know, the, the hands when you're going to church. I've never seen so many people with the last name Bowes. I didn't have a clue who they were. <laughs> There's just bunches of them, hands full of them. And most of them are in the oil business. <laughs> you know, and even on my mother's side, she was a buffing. Uh, even on that side, uh, in the oil business. You know, so I mean, it's, uh, you say anything bad about oil, well, you know, it's, it's not smart. Right. Well, we appreciate your time today, well, you're and, welcome. and welcome. Well, you're you're here on campus, but welcome to your fiftieth reunion. I know it's probably hard to believe. It feels like yesterday, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem like it's been fifty years, but you know, I mean, I don't want to do it over either. <laughs> Thanks again. I mean, I wouldn't want to have to go back to school all that time. <laughs> That's the only thing I don't want to do again.